I'd now like to introduce today's session. UC Berkeley institutional data analysts have the enviable, in my opinion, and challenging job of collecting, analyzing, and presenting huge data sets in an easy to understand way that allows campus leaders to make data-driven decisions. Today, four institutional research analysts are here to talk about their work. You will get an overview of the work they contribute to and the related data sources they leverage, including select undergraduate surveys, such as the UC Undergraduate Experience Survey uh, and the, the new questions about COVID-19, teaching metrics and Cal Answers, and federal and UCOP reporting. I'm going to hand it over now to Sarita Alexander, the Director of the Office of Planning and Analysis, to kick off today's session. Use the applause icon to welcome Sarita. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen? Okay, so it's welcome. It's good to be here and thank everyone. I'm thanking everyone for being here as well on this morning, a new time and a new day. So we are here to share with you what we do as an office, the Office of Planning and Analysis, and we also have our colleague, Andrew Epic here from the Division of Equity and Inclusion. There are four of us who will be presenting today. Each one of us will introduce ourselves um, for our specific session or section. And so I'll kick us off by sharing with you what we do as an office overall, and then my colleagues will go deeper into some of their work. At any point in time, if you have questions, you can feel free to add them to the chat. And one of us will be monitoring the chat and helping the others answer those questions. Okay, so the Office of Planning and Analysis, this is our mission. So we are the IR office, the Institutional Research Office for the UC Berkeley campus. And our mission is to support data-informed decision-making on the Berkeley campus and also in other arenas as well, such as with with UCOP. We engage with and promote success within our campus community, and we focus on producing analyses that are objective, actionable, and creative, and you'll see some of that analyses today. And uh, we also really aim to communicate the story of Berkeley via data in a very clear way and using innovative tools. And you will learn a little bit more, a little bit more about those innovative tools as we go along. And we also had a session back in February that highlighted some of those tools as well. And our goal is really to help the audience find data digestible and to make sense of it in a way that they can then take it and make action based on that data. This slide shows us the organization um, of our office, as well as where we fit in the larger scheme of campus. And so we report up to the Vice Chancellor of Finance, Rosemary Ray, who reports to the Chancellor. And we also report to Chris Stanich, who is Associate Vice Chancellor of Financial Planning and Analysis. And then we have the Office of Planning and Analysis. And all of the blue boxes here along the bottom represent the staff who are um, directly in OPA and who report up to OPA and the CFO and, you know, the chancellor through that realm. And the other folks who are in the orange boxes, those are folks who sit with us in normal non-COVID times. They sit with us in our suite in University Hall, but they have other reporting lines. And so we have Audrey Thomas who reports to the undergrad to Kathy Koshman's office, um, undergraduate education. We have Malcolm Kwan, who reports to Lisa Alvarez Cohen's office and vice provost for academic planning. And then we have Andrew, who reports to the Division of Equity and Inclusion, as we already mentioned. And Andrew does some things that are slightly different than what we do in OPA. And he also, for example, he supports academic requests for data. So he will help to support faculty members and graduate students who are doing research. And Office of Planning and Analysis, we do not support those kinds of data requests. But Andrew will talk a little bit more about what he does. Um, and then the rest of us in the blue boxes here, um, we have Russ who helps to support count answers, among other things. Russ is the most veteran person in our office. And um, we also have Kira who will be presenting today and sharing with you some of her work. We have Beatrice who will also be sharing some of her work, uh, which includes survey work. Um, and we have Amanda, who helps to support enrollment management 
as well as some of our peer surveys and analysis, such as um, ranking surveys and, and the likes. And then we have Carrie Peterson, who will be presenting next month, as Katie already mentioned, and she supports the data visualizations, as well as some enrollment management and other um, analyses that our office is involved in. So we are, we support planning and decision support in a variety of ways. And one of the ways that I, or some of the items that I will talk about um, are at the high level in undergraduate enrollment management and what we do there. So we support undergraduate enrollment management by helping to set the targets for incoming students. We work with UCLP, we work with the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, so it's not just our decision locally. We work with the Chancellor's Office and Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education, and we help to project how many admitted students there should be, for example, if we're trying to hit a particular enrollment target. And so that's really fun and complicated work, and this is an environment this year, it just so happens that with the COVID-19 situation is that we, we projected certain targets based on what has happened in the past, but we couldn't exactly predict the current student behavior. And so it'll be interesting to see where we actually land with regard to our enrollment. And um, we will keep monitoring this before census snapshot. So I see that there may be a question. Yeah. So if there is a question, if the person can unmute and ask the question, then I can definitely answer it. Ross Nolan, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Okay, Ross's hand just went down. So maybe- Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, I will continue then. So undergraduate enrollment is one area, and we also um, help to project the overall undergraduate population number, uh, because as some of you may know, as a campus, we're trying to maintain steady state on our undergrad population, which is just around 30,000 undergrads. And then we also do some analyses around graduation rates and trying to get a sense of how we can improve graduation rates. Another big area that we work on is the survey analysis work. And Beatrice will go into much greater detail on that. We support two surveys on our campus, Undergraduate Experience Survey, the UQs, and then we also support um, the survey of new students. These anal the analysis from these surveys help us to support campus initiatives, such as the advising initiative that we had a number of years ago and the Discovery Experience initiative that's, rather, uh, that's more recent. We also provide other support, uh, resource support, um, such as um, the temporary academic support modeling, which Kira will talk about, and that has to do with how we uh, generate data so that we can, there could be money attached to the mounting of the curriculum, money that goes to, uh, towards GSIs and lecturers and the like, readers, and so Kira will talk in detail about that, but that, those are also, um, the ways in which we support the campus by doing that analysis in combination with our financial planning and analysis colleagues. And then Kira will also talk about some of the teaching metrics and reporting that we do. So we have a few products and services and we can't list them all, definitely. Um, and here is uh, a list of some of the services that we provide. So one of the areas that we provide support to, and I've already mentioned this a bit, is to Cal Answers. So Russ in particular, but a number of us also support Cal Answers in different ways, and specifically around the student data areas of Cal Answers. We also um, support, we also provide training to new deans and chairs on Cal Answers, and um, we provide some analysis in the survey area. I already mentioned enrollment modeling and Katie earlier mentioned external reporting such as iPads and the common data set. And we also um, support accreditation as well as the foreign language and area studies reporting. 
Sarita, your slides seem to have If someone else can take over presenting, that might be helpful. I have lost my internet connection. I can take over. Let's see. let's see if I can if I can get it back. I, I can pop them up. Okay, you've got it. Thank you, and apologies for the technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> okay, so some of the other highlights, and I won't go through all of these. So Katie already mentioned some of the external reporting that we do, and um, and that includes IPEDS, which is federal reporting, as well as some um, accreditation reporting. And then academic program review is another is another area that is supported by our office. Malcolm Kwan works on that, but also an analyst in our office work to produce some of the underlying data, especially from UQs that feeds into academic program review, such as students' experiences with their GSIs, um, their instructors and access to classes. And so it's really great that we can work, again, across um, cross-collaborate or collaborate with our partners who sit with us but who don't report up to OPA, that we can collaborate them around academic program review, among other things. We then have some recurring reports, as well as um, we provide ad hoc and custom analyses to units on campus, and we support task force work. And we're actually currently working with Arts and Humanities on some analyses that supports one of their task force. And um, so we do want to convey today that we support the campus, we support UCOP, we support um, external federal reporting requirements, and we also support um, leadership uh, in making decisions. So we have our hands in a number of different areas, and um, we want you all to know that we're available to you included in this mix of people we support. So the next slide, please. Okay, and so another area that we, um, support in our office and we've developed is something called Our Berkeley. I will not go into great detail here. As I mentioned, we presented at CAN in February, I believe, on Our Berkeley. And so you can see that, um, that slide deck in Katie's files that she provides. But Our Berkeley is a public-facing uh, set of dashboards that anyone can access, who anyone who has internet access and can access this website can, can access. And we have these broad categories that folks can select, and then when you select, let's say, admissions or enrollment, the little tiles, the dashboards will appear that are relevant for that topic, and you will see a visualization. Most of these are Tableau visualizations, and you will see Berkeley data visualized and with a narrative along the top that helps walk you through the story of that data. And this is a relatively new uh, set of data and visualization that we have, and we encourage everyone on campus to make use of it. You can uh, find this on the OPA website, opa.berkeley.edu. The next slide. And then finally, I leave you with a link to the our Berkeley Data Digest, so that once you receive these slides, you can click on the link and go directly there if you like. And this is just one example of a dashboard that's actually in D3 uh, that is available via Our Berkeley so that you can get a sense of, of every 100 students, how many, what percentage are transfer students, what percentage are African Americans, and so forth. And so with that, I will turn it over to Kira Blaisdell Sloan, and she will introduce herself as well as take over the presentation. Thank you, Sarita. Um, as Sarita mentioned, I'm just going to get my slides up. Um, I'm another analyst in OPA. Let's see if this just goes real quick. Um, can you guys see my screen OK? Yes. OK, it looks like okay. you can. And. I work on issues particularly related to curriculum and curriculum and budget. I also support a lot of the reporting on campus. So I thought I'd walk you through sort of what I do um, and the kind of metrics we look at. 
um, in trying to help support decision making on campus. Um, first, I thought I'd uh, start by defining what uh, teaching metrics are because I didn't know how much all of you might uh, know about this or how familiar you might be in thinking about this. When I say teaching metrics, I mean things like course counts, student counts, faculty counts, and sort of what I call here compound counts, sort of mixes of those. So things like what percentage of each kind of faculty taught what kind of students, who's teaching what, who's teaching who, and how much teaching is going on. Um, the data we have, I think it's really important to stress, comes from the department. This isn't data we create. This is data that exists in the wild as part of the natural business processes of campus. So when courses are created in CIS and students enroll, we capture that data. Um, but we do not create the data ourselves. It's, it's sort of created by all of you all who are in the departments. Um, some, some of it comes from CIS and is direct teaching data. Some of it comes from other systems like the HR system or the payroll system that I work with particularly. We also have, as Sarita mentioned, survey data, but I'm really gonna emphasize on these teaching metrics that come, that come from the um, systems that we use our, themselves. Um, Berkeley measures teaching two ways, and I think this is a really important thing, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it. Um, we, we capture it by what's called listing department and by credited department. Um, and this is because there's different kinds of uses we have for the data, and there's different ways we can think about who the data belongs to. Um, by listing department is more or less how it appears if you were to open the class schedule. Um, I call this a student's perspective. If a student wants to know how many chemistry courses there are, they look at everything that starts with the word chemistry in, in the schedule, and those are the courses they think of as having um, as their options for chemistry. But the fact is, is that chemistry professors might actually teach things in natural resources or other departments throughout campus. And so we also like to capture the actual work of the faculty irrespective of where it happens to occur. And we call this by credited department. So we both have the ability to look at what is being offered and available to fulfill student requirements and sort of the overall workload of the department. Um, this is especially useful, the accredited department is especially useful for things like financial planning or workforce planning because it may be that a certain kind of chemistry course is, for example, always taught by a mathematician. So that in that case, the math department may need a faculty member to sort of support that and that's, that's sort of what the difference is trying to get at. Teaching by credited department can get complicated because sometimes people have multiple appointments and sometimes classes are co-taught. Um, on the OPA website, you'll see here sort of down at the bottom, I left a little link. We have a whole set of rules that um, were approved quite a while back by a former provost that tell us how we give credit to departments. The essential idea is that it's based on payroll. And when somebody has more than one payroll, it goes, it matches the, depart the listing department. So if you're paid by math and chemistry and you're teaching a chemistry class, chemistry gets the credit for your course. Um, but again, there's lots of weird cases in there, and so we have a very complicated set of rules that you could uh, look at at your leisure. And this diagram sort of highlights uh, some of what they look like. We use the teaching data for all sorts of different um, processes. Uh, campus resource allocation is one of the things that happens. So uh, the budget committee looks at this uh, on a, for approval of new faculty FTE lines, that is who gets funded for new instructors, permanent instructors. Uh, we use it for calculating the task budget for GSIs, readers, and visiting faculty. We use it for divisional and departmental budget decisions. We also use it for broader reporting, much of which gets us um, funding as well. 
we report to UCOP and the legislature um, for things like capital projects funding requests. We um, re report it to UCOP for faculty workload discussions. Um, we've been had the data requested for system-wide union disputes and uh, means of either resolving it or showing that we've resolved issues. And we use it for federal reporting. I'm going to go into some detail on four of these specifically. Uh, the approval of new faculty FTE lines, task budgets, um, a little bit of reporting, and uh, particularly to UCOP and the legislature. So you can get a feel of how what this data looks like and how we use it in terms of how it's used for decision support. Um, The faculty, what used to be called the faculty FTE call data. So every year departments are uh, given a call to ask for new faculty and they're expected to write a letter as to why they need the faculty member that they, the kind of faculty member that they've asked for. And then um, the budget committee goes through and assesses who, who's gonna get those positions. Um, these decisions are what I would call metrics informed. So that is the data supports the decision, but it's not formulaic in any way. It's there as a support for letters of excellence, um, balance within the department, factors that take into account things like recent retirements and what the new shape of the profession is going to be. But it also helps answer some basic questions about the state of that, that given department. Um, so specific questions that we consistently help answer with this data is how many majors and degrees is a department supporting? How many faculty do they have to do that? How do faculty leaves impact this? How much is being done by other instructors who aren't the regular ladder faculty? Um, how many classes are a given department's faculty teaching in a year? And has this changed over time? And how does a given department's data compared to UC Berkeley's and the division's average. So again, this isn't going to give the answer. The budget committee really does look at the entire package as they're presented, but it helps them think through if there's two cases that are kind of the same, which, which department looks like it's struggling with dealing with its teaching load. Um, to answer these questions, we report on raw data and what I would call comparative ratios. So for each department on campus, we provide the number of what are called incumbent faculty FTE. That is how many full-time faculty do they have on the books, as well as payroll faculty FTE, which are in any given year, how many of those faculty are actually here and available to teach, whether they're teaching or not, how many of them are are available. We also look at the percent on at the percentage of faculty on leave. We um, have a series of metrics of student demand, so major headcount, degree recipient headcount, and what's called SCH or student credit hours taught by all instructors. And this is essentially if one student earns three units for a class, it's the sum of all of those units that they earn. Um, with the understanding that each undergraduate, at least, needs 120 of those units to graduate minimum. Instructional workload is where the ratios come in. So we do things like provide them with student credit hours per actual that is available or payroll faculty FTE. The number of classes that every faculty, each faculty on average has taught in a given year, and the percentage of SCH taught by um, faculty who are not the latter faculty, uh, what, what in Cal Answers we call non-regular faculty. Um, and again, this is sort of, this is informative to the budget committee and for the departments who are writing the letter, and, but it isn't any sort of formulaic calculation. The, EBC, the EBCP task allocation, on the other hand, is a formulaic allocation, and it's used to um, answer this essential question. How do we equi equitably support the growth in enrollment on campus or declines in enrollment within, um, within particular units? How do we adjust to that? 
Um, historically on campus, we've, we've done a more of an incremental budget where everybody just went up a certain amount and some people squeaked if it wasn't enough and some people didn't. But in recent years, as I'm sure you all know, campus has grown a lot. So we've really made an effort to make this um, more standardized and, and essentially fairer. Um, the task that was given to uh, Central Campus, and we worked with the budget office on this, uh, was to answer the question really at a departmental level, although we allocate at the divisional level, um, what's it cost to teach or total number of units that we need to teach to get students graduating? Um, you know, what did it cost in the most recent year available? How many more do we expect to teach next year? Uh, and how much would we expect those that growth to cost? Particularly because the growth was beyond what we've done historically, campus wanted to come pretty close to shouldering all the costs of the growth. That is, we didn't expect that the departments would be able to pay for the growth. So the goal was that we would, we would actually fully fund the growth. And we also knew that we, they had baseline funding to cover what, what they had been teaching already, but that, those, that baseline funding need to, needed to grow um, in line with expenses that related to things like um, union mandated salary increases or increases in the calculated benefits rate. Some of these basic things that we know go up every year. This was, in retrospect, like the questions I've got here seem pretty straightforward, but at the time that we were doing them, this was a new way of thinking about things. So a big part of the challenge with this process was actually even coming up with those bullet points of questions, thinking what is the right question to ask to answer that bigger question at the top, how do we equitably support the growth and enrollment on campus? Um, let's see, once we did that, we came up with a, a formula um, which involved calculating out in, a, in an actually very complex way, some of the cost inflation measures, answering that question, how, if we taught exactly the same thing we did in the most recent year where we've got data available, what would it cost next year, right? This was our first step. And so that was our first bit of sort of incremental funding growth. And then to that, we needed to add how much growth would we reasonably expect we're going to have for next year, which is your projected growth in what we call pass eligible SCH. Um, we picked a subset of courses that would actually require funding as opposed to including things that would never get funding for um, the temporary academic support. And then we multiplied that by a dollars per student credit hour that we had calculated based on what it cost before. So if we got a hundred student credit hours and it cost $1 per student credit hour in our historical past. And we knew that that same student credit hour would cost $1.20 today or next year actually. Then we would say it's going to cost $120 to teach that same number of student credit hours next year. But if we added more student credit hours, we would know that we could increment it up. Um, this is, again, this is how we're currently um, have been calculating for a few years now our temporary academic support and how our divisions get what I would call additional funding. They have their own baseline funding, but additional funding to support temporary instructors, GSIs, readers, and tutors. And, and it has grown substantially. The amount we've been allocating has grown substantially as campus has grown and as expenses has gone, have gone up, um, as it should, so that we can support our departments and divisions in continuing to teach more students. UCOP reporting um, happens in all sorts of different processes. Um, 
But the key thing that I would like to emphasize about it is that by providing data to UCOP, we allow UCOP to conduct and report different kinds of cross-campus analyses. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is the Instructional Activities Report. And this just sort of categorizes um, the faculty into different things. Again, that ladder faculty, retired faculty, GSIs, visiting faculty, medical faculty. There's a whole different series of categories that they want us to put our faculty in. In this case, it's based on title codes. And then they would like, they ask us to report um, different measures of students who take those courses. So student credit hours, enrollments. And then they ask us to report other system data. Again, this is data that was put into the system when the courses were created in the course system as to what kind of course these are. Are they lab courses? Are they courses with sections, without sections? And again, this is a standard report we do every year and it gives UCOP the data in a standardized format across all the campuses um, to answer broader system-wide questions. Um, finally, the last example I was going to cover has to do with federal reporting. Um, this is also resource support uh, because this is required for a series of different grants. The biggest one that I assist with is the foreign language and area studies uh, reporting. This is because we have uh, one of the larger area studies programs in the country, actually. And there is a whole series of things that both to put in a grant request you need to have, and then after the fact, the federal government requires us to demonstrate that we have actually been teaching area studies uh, courses. So we have eight different area studies uh, centers in our, or areas, that we teach in our, on our campus. And they wanna know how many students take 20 units at least um, within a given area. And of those, how many do choose to study abroad? And where do they go? How many degrees do our students get out of the area studies department? That is, what are we, what are, what is the federal government supporting? And, and this is sort of just part of the standard reporting we do. We don't come up with the questions. We don't even come up with a format the data goes out in. It goes out in a very lovely vintage 1970s format. But it does allow us to support um, about, again, it varies from year to year, but on a, on a low year, almost $4 million of student funding. Or if you've seen students in your various departments, for those of you in departments who get foreign language and area studies fellowships, this is, um, this is a big, uh, this is, this is a big part of how we get that money. The other part, of course, is the faculty going ahead and writing the grants to support them. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Beatrice Brando, and do you want to take it over, Beatrice? Yep, I can take over. Let me just get myself set up. I'm stopping sharing for you. Um, yep, let me... Sorry, all This is one of my first Zoom presentations, so I'm still fumbling with this. All right, share screen. and let me get myself okay can everyone see my screen um all right okay awesome so let me put this in presentation mode so it's prettier and will be great all right um so just really quickly let me introduce myself uh my name is beatrice brando i am an institutional research analyst and uh I'll, i do a lot of different types of work in OPA, but a large part of my work is actually with our surveys. Um, so both managing um, our two signature surveys and also doing like survey analysis and data polls for other surveys. So I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of this work and some of the resources that we have available. Um, I did want to give you all a fair warning that there is a little bit of window washing happening in my building. So um, there may be a little bit of mechanical noise in the background and there is a chance that we might have an extra participant in the background in the future. So um, let's get started. 
Um, so a little bit about our signature student surveys. So OPA manages two surveys, um, campus-wide surveys whose uh, data is used to support academic program review and select campus initiatives. So those are UQs, which is our UC undergraduate experience survey, and SUNS, which is our survey of new students. Um, the other thing that we do is that OPA periodically provides consultation, random or stratified sample, and select reporting in support of other campus surveys. So we've done this, for example, for the career destination survey, the campus climate survey, the cost of attendance survey, and the national college health assessment. Um, it's worth noting that there is no central body on campus that manages surveys. So students will receive like surveys from various different uh, various different, you know, academic units throughout the year. Um, and the only two that we're really in charge of are SUNS and UQs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about SUNS. So uh, SUNS is administered yearly at the start of every fall semester. It remains open during the first six to eight weeks of the student's first semester. And all new students, both freshmen and transfer students, are invited to complete the survey. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to complete, and uh, our recent response rate for it was about 62% of students. So our new students are very generous survey takers, which is always really exciting because we really want to make sure that we have a good representation of that population. Um, and it's designed to kind of capture students' academic, co-curricular, and social experiences during their transition to UC Berkeley. Um, so UQs is a little bit different. So UQs isn't just a UC Berkeley survey, it's a University of California system-wide survey. Um, it was historically administered every year at Berkeley, but since 2012, it's been administered every other year. Um, and all undergraduates are invited to complete the survey. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to complete Sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's a little lower. This year was a little bit higher. Um, and our most recent response rate, so for 2020, was 39% uh, of students completed the survey, um, which for a campus-wide survey like that is actually pretty good. We were really, and considering the COVID-19 climate, we were very impressed that students were so generous with us. Um, it's administered from April until July of the spring semester, and um, UQ's responses are then matched with institutional data to provide a detailed portrait of the student's background, their academic and co-curricular activities, their goals and aspirations, and their experiences with academic and administrative units. Um, and then self-assessments and gains in academic and social skills. So another exciting part about UQs is the wildcard module. So the majority of UQs consists of shared standardized items that are negotiated system-wide. However, each campus has the option to develop a wildcard module that focuses on topics specific to the campus. Um, and we've used this many years, um, and we've used this to explore like specific campus initiatives and concerns, such as co-curricular advising. We've done, uh, the last couple of years, we've looked at discovery learning experiences in response to the discovery learning uh, initiative. Uh, we've looked at the affordability and accessibility of course reading um, and many other topics, but it's like a really exciting piece because you have UQs, which is developed system wide and a lot of it actually is developed even more broadly with like the Ceru consortium, um, which is like universities across the country and even internationally and they develop a core set of questions and then we develop some additional UQs questions and then UC Berkeley can ask these like very specific UC Berkeley questions to the entire campus. Um, so UQs is really important in decision making. Some's also, but UQ since it covers the entire population ends up being a particularly important um, survey for this kind of information. Um, so we've looked at it to look at campus climate um, because it provides measures of how welcoming and inclusive the campus environment is for students of various backgrounds. Um, we've looked at it in terms of a but we're looking at affordability um, because it captures perceptions, students' perceptions regarding how manageable the cost of attendance is. And um, we've been looking at measures of housing and food security, um, in particular homelessness and hunger. And then it also looks at co-curricular and research experiences. How many hours are students spending on these different activities? Um, you know, how much time are they spending on work or research with faculty? 
Um, and then it also looks at advising. So how satisfied are students with their advisings and what are like the impacts of uh, advising in their lives? Um, so that's a little bit about the surveys. I did wanna see if anybody has any questions about our surveys before I talk about some of the resources we have available about the surveys. Um, if you have any questions, either throw them into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask me directly. All right, let's uh, dive into our OPA survey resources. So we don't only collect the survey data, we also look at ways that we can share this data with the campus community more broadly. And we have a lot of nice resources available on our website that anybody can access and explore. Um, so the first is our SUNS results and summary. So for each year, we provide a effectively a summary of the responses that students have for SUNS. We break it down into three areas. So there's a section for freshmen, there's a section for um, transfer students, and there's a section for students in the fall program for freshmen. Um, and it sort of provides tables with like the counts and percentages for each of the questions. So as we can see here um, in 2019, uh, students when asked about their transition to UC Berkeley, um, most of them felt like they were off to a pretty good start. Um, you know, it seems like over 50% were saying that they were between good and a great start and a much smaller percent, you know, less than 20%, 15% were at not a good start or just an okay. Oh, um, I see that we have a question um, from Michelle Rapkin asking how far in advance do you need to request wildcard questions? Um, so we start preparing our wildcard module about um, the semester before it goes out. So UQs is a spring survey and we try to finalize all of our wildcard questions um, by December before it goes out. So for this case um, year, we finalized all of our questions by December 2019 in order to be prepared for the April start of um, UQs. Ideally though, we start this work actually at the beginning of the fall semester. So if you're interested in adding items to UQs, um, you would probably need to reach out to us in the fall. We do have to balance many initiatives on campus. So we add what we can while still trying to make sure that the survey doesn't get too unbearable to our students. So there's a little bit of weighing pros and cons that we have to go into that, but we are always welcome to talk to people about potential additions to the UQ's wildcard. Um, yeah, so let me talk next about some of the other resources we have available. So we also have the UQ's results and summary. And beginning with the UQ's 2018, uh, we've actually developed, uh, well, we, uh, others at the UC Berkeley uh, OPA office have developed a really awesome uh, Tableau dashboard for this. And what's really exciting about it is it allows you to not only look at each question, but to filter on student characteristics. So for example, if we were interested in how much time students spent in a given academic year, so on paid employment on and off campus, we can look at it for the entire student population, but we can also look at it, for example, by gender, uh, looking at what do female students say, what do male students say, and what do students who decline to state say. Um, and we have it for a variety of characteristics, such as when they, um, their entry status, uh, whether or not they're a Pell recipient, which allows us to kind of, uh, it's a stand in for whether or not students are low income and a variety of other uh, student characteristics. Um, so the other thing we have is we have some dashboards that incorporate survey data, which are really exciting. So one of them is the student experience uh, dashboard. And this one provides uh, data from the 20, uh, from various years of the UQ's data. So it allows you to look at it longitudinally and it provides it in a graphic form. So in this case, we're looking at um, the students' responses to the question, how strongly they agree with, I feel valued as an individual on this campus. And if we look at all freshman entrants, um, we can see that um, we've had a little bit of a slight decrease here. Uh, which isn't ideal, but um, it does happen. And then we can also see though, are there any differences between California residents and non-residents? Um, and it's kind of hard to say based on this, but it looks like overall that non-residents feel maybe a little bit more value than California residents. Um, and you're allowed to, you can break it down by various other categories. You can break it down by ethnicity, you can break it down by gender, and you can look at a variety of questions here, such as, 
Do they feel that UC Berkeley is a welcoming campus? Do they have inconsistent access to housing? Um, and it allows you know, the campus community to get a better sense of what are students feeling and what are students feeling about the campus over time. Um, finally, a couple other areas we have is we've developed a variety of presentations and reports. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about two of them. So the first is the fall undergraduate snapshot. Um, so this is a report that we produce each year um, and it pulls, um, it combines the data from Cal Answers with data from our survey of new students to get, provide a picture of that fall class and in particular characteristics of the fall incoming class. Um, as we can see here, one of the things we talk about is the social, the self-reported social class of students by entry status. Um, and we can see that there's a similar proportion of new freshmen and transfer respondents that reported that they would best describe their social class as being middle class. However, a greater proportion of new transfer students as compared to new freshman respondents would describe their social class when growing up as being either working class or low income or poor, comparing here 48% versus 28%. So that allows us, that tells us that our transfer students and our freshman students are coming, are, you know, slightly different socioeconomic statuses. You have a quick question. Um, yeah. From Avi saying, do non-resident undergrads tend to live in the dorms more than in-staters? I don't know, actually. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if we've looked into that, but that would be an interesting thing to look at. Uh, sorry, I, I, that's a really good point and that would be worth looking at. We do have that data. I don't know if anyone's actually done the analysis to see um, if uh, out-of-state students versus in uh, versus uh, in-state students uh, have like a higher or lower percentage of living in the dorms. Um, yeah, I, that's an interesting question and it might be worth looking at. Uh, Great. So the final one I wanted to talk about is another really cool thing that we can do because we have both a survey of new students and the UQs is actually pair our survey of new students results with our UQs results. So we have several reports where we look at the first year undergraduate experience. So this is a, um, you can find the presentations on our website. And we look at this question about percent of students who agree with students of my race and ethnicity are respected on campus. And what we've done is we've taken the incoming class of students, so this is both transfer and fresh, new freshmen, and we've looked at what they said when they started at Suns, and then what they said, um, uh, what they said when they uh, responded to UQs uh, later that year. So this is for years where we have Suns and UQs in the same academic year, and a sort of disturbing trend comes up, which is that students feelings that their students of the race and ethnicity are respected on this campus goes down over the course of their first year. And this is particularly true for um, Chicano, Latino students and African American students. So we're sort of finding that over the course of students first year at UC Berkeley, their perceptions of campus climate like decrease in some cases very dramatically, um, which indicates that there's maybe something going on here and that we need to see what we can do to improve campus climate so that students don't start feeling like they're really comfortable here and then have experiences that cause them to feel like they're really not comfortable here by the end of their first year. Um, I see that we have another question asking, how do international students fit into class background? Um, I are you asking in, uh, so would you mind for the person who asked this to give me a little bit more context as to what you mean? Are you asking in response to the previous slide about um, class mm -hmm. background? Yes, in, in response to the previous slide. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we didn't look at that for this report. We only looked at like new freshmen versus new transfers. My understanding, and I don't have the numbers right off the bat, is I believe that international students do tend to be usually a, a um, they, they tend to have a slightly higher socio, uh, social class or socioeconomic status, um, in part just because they have to be able to afford uh, the out-of-state yeah. tuition. Uh -huh. Thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, so um, really quickly, um, in this presentation slide, I've included uh, just uh, links to 
the various things that I talked about and some extra uh, reports and presentations and our Berkeley dashboards that might be relevant to people interested in these results. And really quickly, before I pass this off to Andrew, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the additions that we've made to the 2020 UQs and SUNS in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in response to COVID-19 and the switch to remote learning, new items were created for both the 2020 UQs and the SUNS surveys. So the topics include attitudes and concerns about COVID-19 and remote learning, fall 2020 enrollment and housing plans, and also looking at students' experiences with remote learning. Um, the other interesting thing that we did this year that we don't normally do is that in addition to the creation of the new, these new items, we also conducted preliminary analyses of the UQ's COVID-19 items as the survey was out in the field in order to help inform campus decision making like on the spot. So normally we would wait until the survey was completed and do all of our analysis in the fall, but given how urgent it was to really know what was going on with students and what were their plans, um, we actually did a lot of this analysis as as the survey was out in the field. Once we hit like certain bench, you know, certain amounts of response rates, we started producing um, regular reports. And um, my colleague Andrew is actually going to talk about some of these analyses that he did um, uh, for like looking at these COVID nineteen items. So. Um, if there are any final questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I will pass it off to Andrew, who has a really exciting uh, piece to talk about with all of you. All right. Uh, Andrew, you ready for me to hand it off to you? I'm ready. I'm just gonna bring up my screen. <laughs> okay. All right. Just as a heads up, my cat has joined me, so you may hear some meowing in the background. All right. Do let me know if there are any technical issues. I'm, I should be presenting right now. So I'm gonna be, as, as Beatrice said, I'll be talking about a preliminary analysis of UQ's COVID-19 questions uh, from back in the spring, early on, uh, there was a lot of real urgency to sort of see what was happening with these questions. Uh, and so in April, just shortly after the, the shelter in place had started, um, we had a decent number of responses. And so OPA and myself were working on looking at these questions and one of the questions was around, you know, fall enrollment and sort of that planning process. As Sarita mentioned, planning uh, for fall enrollment is a critical um, aspect of what OPA does um, and for our campus operations. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to look at some of the more experiential aspects of what was happening with the, the shelter in place and remote learning. So there were sort of two research questions. So you know, what were the, the, the issues facing undergraduate students and their experiences with remote learning overall, as well as how did these experiences vary across affinity groups? And in particular, are there specific groups whose needs uh, we as a campus should be addressing? And so there were a total of 37 extra questions relating to COVID-19 for spring 2020. This is a special year. These were front loaded at the very beginning of the survey. This was very extraordinary. A lot of great work out of the Office of the President team of IRAP, the office that administers UQs overall. And um, just a lot of, of, of real uh, great work on the back end from, from everyone. And so the current analysis here, I'm going to be looking at concerns from students about remote learning and personal issues about COVID-19. This is not everything, this is far from exhaustive, partially because there's just so many questions and also because I don't wanna take two hours to go through all the results with you, even though you might be interested. Uh, just as, as a note, uh, there are, I do have some additional findings in detail at the end of this presentation in terms of appendix slides. So if you're really interested to dig into some of these things, you're welcome to, to look there. Just as a note, these are based off of the April 27th respondents. 
So obviously, many more people responded over the course of the survey. As Beatrice mentioned, we had 39% response rate. So this is only a fraction of that. Uh, one thing to note, however, is that I did do a reanalysis to see if there were any real changes. And overall, there were uh, the, the patterns uh, held, um, which is good from a statistical sense and, and bad from a how are students doing sense. Uh, just to note, these are just the respondents who responded. Uh, there's no waiting to match the campus. Uh, so there, any variations in response rates are a potential confound for these results. Just as, so just as a heads up. Um, so, um, one thing just overall, uh, so I'm, these findings around looking at uh, minoritized groups. And so we found that overall, uh, students report monitor high levels of concern about remote learning and their personal experiences. But these uh, concerns tend to be elevated for marginalized and minoritized groups um, on all the questions. So what do I mean when I'm talking about marginalized and minoritized groups. So we're talking about women, uh, transgender and non-conforming, uh, LGBTQ+, Pacific Islander, URM, uh, low SES, uh, disabled, and first generation college. And the areas of highest concern were around coursework and tests, learning effectively, and being isolated from friends. And in terms of personal experiences, the the gaps uh, varied across. So the largest gaps were things around access to healthcare, libraries, uh, internet, uh, finding study spaces, uh, learning support services, paying bills, meeting basic needs. Uh, and just one thing is that these gaps, these large gaps are not unique to Berkeley students. These reflect broader inequities in our society that existed prior to COVID-19, but have been exacerbated by the pandemic as we've seen uh, again and again uh, in uh, over the past several months. Uh, one thing I also did is I looked across divisions. I'm not gonna be focusing as much on this, but I produced a dashboard for divisions that showed uh, every uh, division department on campus uh, what uh, the responses were for their department. And uh, there was variation, as you might expect, across the divisions, the less though than looking across demographic groups. And in fact, the variation across units was almost entirely driven by demographics because you have units like arts and humanities or social sciences that have far more uh, women, URMs, all of these minoritized groups than, say, engineering, chemistry, or more uh, traditional STEM fields. So that, that was a big part of it. Also, part of it is uh, driven by who's planning to graduate prior to fall 2019. Part of what I was sharing with them, that I won't be sharing here, is how students intended to enroll in fall 2020. There's a lot of interest in that. And some of the very, one of the analysis that both Beatrice and I did removed the students who said, no, I'm graduating, that's why I'm not enrolling in the fall, which was an important uh, thing to look at. Um, so that was part of it, the variation across the divisions. There were, some, however, some discipline-specific patterns. So again, most of the variation across divisions was driven by demographics. However, there were things that were not demographically linked. And in surprisingly, it makes sense to the specific needs of various different disciplines. So in lab sciences, particularly chemistry and the biosciences, there was the highest level of concern about their ability to do research as a result of COVID-19. Not surprisingly, they need to be in a lab for that. Uh, whereas you can uh, you know, be reading something online and doing something that's not in a lab uh, for other disciplines, if you need to be in that lab space, you're gonna be concerned about your research. Uh, Non-lab disciplines, particularly social sciences and the humanities, show the highest concerns about access to libraries. Again, not surprising if you've been you know, delving into archives and maybe it's not all digitized, you need to go into that library and get a book. And now, maybe if you're now in, in Southern California, you're far away from that uh, campus library. You can't do that work. So not surprising, but it's good to note that these are uh, variations across departments. And just as a quick aside, 
Um, there was very little variation um, across uh, divisions in terms of who was enrolling in the fall. Uh, and uh, pretty much everybody was planning on it. The variation we see left is mostly around residency, where do you see the largest numbers of international or non-residents. Um, so moving on, I'm gonna delve into these specific questions. So learning concerns. So here are the questions that I'm gonna be looking at, which is how concerned are you about the possible effects of COVID-19 on your learning? And we have 11 sort of sub questions from having reliable access to the internet, being able to learn effectively in remote instruction, having access to appropriate study space, accessing the learning support services such as tutoring, library services, not doing well on tests and online courses, missing class, being able to conduct research, courses for majors, interacting with faculty outside of class, and then some uh, other learning concerns. Now, uh, respondents could select not concerned, somewhat concerned, concerned, or very concerned. So there are four response options. I dichotomize the res results into uh, zero for not concerned or somewhat concerned, and one for concerned or very concerned. And what I'm gonna be doing is showing the percentages of higher concern. So what percentage of respondents were concerned or very concerned with these questions? So here are these questions. And what I've done here is I've broken out these 11 questions uh, for overall respondents for, and then I've uh, split students, I've sort of tried to summarize across all these different dimensions. Again, in the appendix, you can see all the different demographic breakouts. But what I did is I took these marginalizations that I mentioned at the beginning and sort of said, let's look at gender, sexuality, race, uh, class, disability, um, and combine them all together and say, how many of these does this particular respondent have? They can have none of them or they could have uh, one, two, three, four, five, or six of them, because there's six different categories. And so what I did is I have everybody overall in this all column, and then I have people who were none of these six, and then students who are four or more. So we're comparing uh, some of the most marginalized students to some of the least marginalized. One, then one caveat to note, there are, uh, this is uh, a limited view uh, in that some of these might be a little more salient than others, and there might be other dimensions that are not included here. These are based off of the demographics from UQs itself. So there are things that are not captured here. Uh, so uh, we have class growing up, but that's not actual financial resources. So that's not captured here explicitly. We also have um, things around uh, sort of immigration status. There are lots of other ways that um, students could be facing marginalization or minoritization, things around being system impacted, et cetera, um, that aren't, aren't here. So I just want to put that caveat that this is not exhaustive or the end all be all. But we do see some very interesting things looking at this. So I've sorted these by the overall concern. So we see that overall students were not that concerned with reliable access to the internet, only 27% of uh, these students. However, 83% uh, of the students were concerned with doing well on tests uh, and assignments and learning effectively in the remote instruction environment. So very wide variation across these questions. One thing we also note is that when we compare the students with uh, none of these dimensions of marginalization to students with four or more, we see very large gaps appearing. Again, uh, this gap over in the leftmost column shows how much more concerned the uh, four or more group is from the no, uh, the, the zero group. And we see that while only one in four of students were concerned about getting reliable access to the internet, we see that's actually almost half of the students with four or more. This is not surprising. The digital divide is well documented, but we see it appearing among these respondents. Uh, we also see some of the areas of greatest concern at the top 
even though students overall are concerned about doing assignments and testing or instruction, almost all of the students in this four or more category uh, were, were concerned with it. So a gap of around 20 points. The largest gaps we see, uh, when we see a 40 point gap were for access to study space as well as sort of other learning concerns. Uh, so we see very large differences uh, across these groups, uh, across these questions and between the sort of more marginalized and, and lesser marginalized groups. And I think it's a really important thing when thinking about what does that mean? And so as a campus, right, so I've shared these results earlier with, with cabinet, with deans and chairs, um, thinking of other campus leadership to sort of think, what does it mean to do this? And so as a campus, we've been doing things like uh, providing technology for, for students, trying to make sure that they have internet hotspots, that they have the technology to be able to access the internet, to be able to do classes as we move into a remote instruction for the fall. So these are really, a really important uh, data points to have uh, to really just show the need uh, for, for very large communities of our students. Moving on beyond the remote instruction questions, we have sort of personal concerns. What's happening in their lives um, that they are concerned about, uh, especially with respect, respect to COVID-19. So we had nine questions here from not graduating on time to not attending their commencement to losing their job, not getting a job after graduation, paying their bills, being isolated from friends, accessing healthcare, meeting basic needs such as food and housing, and other. And again, there were four response options from not concerned to very concerned. Responses have been dichotomized from uh, zero to one with not concerned, somewhat concerned, and zero concerned and very concerned as one. And again, we're showing percentages of higher concern. So what does this look like? So what we see here is that again, large variation uh, and that the largest concern for respondents was being isolated from friends. Uh, that social isolation is, is very real. I'm sure we've all felt it as well. And that on the lowest end, we see students not so concerned with not graduating on time. Um, so again, large variation, not quite as much variation as we saw in the remote learning questions, but still a very large uh, spread. And again, we see huge spread uh, across when we can look at the demographics and we look at our lesser marginalized uh, and minoritized students compared to the more marginalized and minoritized. So for instance, we see uh, place where it's actually relatively modest is being out of the difference. Pretty much everybody's concerned about that. Uh, our more minoritized and marginalized students are slightly more concerned about it, nine points but it's relatively small gap compared to other ones. For instance, paying bills. We see a 46 point increase there where almost four in five of our four plus group is concerned about paying bills, whereas it's only one in three of the students who have none of these uh, dimensions. Uh, and again, this is not surprising in terms of what we see in that broader data around you know, who's lost their jobs, who's struggled, who's been furloughed or laid off. But it makes a, a, a big difference when looking at which groups we're seeing. Similarly, very large, uh, other and also accessing healthcare and basic needs. Uh, Ruben mentioned in the comments before the questions around basic needs. If you don't know Ruben, uh, he's amazing. He works, uh, is, uh, one of the leaders in the Basic Needs uh, Center on campus and uh, has been doing really essential work uh, for, for the campus, especially during this uh, shelter in place. But we can see that 64, well, only one in five of the uh, students with none of these dimensions, we see that it's almost two in three of the students with four or more. So a gap of 44 points. So that Basic Needs is a huge concern for uh, our more minoritized and marginalized students. And so uh, I wanna, I've been going through this uh, quite uh, um, quickly. I wanna open it up to uh, questions 
uh, about this uh, or about uh, the analyses just to uh, you have some questions in chat and great yep the last three it looks like all right thank you so i've got um some questions i have a question from alfred saying what were some of the other learning concerns specified by students in q1.11 uh, it's a good question and uh, i actually um I think that other learning, correct me if I'm wrong, Beatrice, when we looked at this, that was primarily questions around uh, in-person learning in the fall. Is that right? Or am I missing that? I think that was, I'm, I'm sure that that's part of it. I think that that was for a different other category. I okay. think we haven't done a deep dive into this one yet, though I think it's something that we're, at least I'm interested in doing for the future. So I'm not, we haven't had the opportunity, I think, to do a thorough analysis of that qualitative data yet. Yeah, um, yeah, so it's a good question. And I think there's obviously a lot more work to do around uh, deep dive. Part of that, the, the challenge around uh, the other questions is that students did have an option to add commentary to a text box and uh, Beatrice, who did a ton of work looking at some of the qualitative responses, uh, just looking at, at uh, just a couple of them, it's a lot of work. And so given trying to get results out quickly, uh, we haven't had a chance to do that really in-depth necessary work to look at all the qualitative responses. So there's a real uh, opportunity uh, there for some additional, additional work. Um, so then I, I, let me know if I didn't answer your question, Alfred. Um, we have a question from uh, Jennifer uh, around questions around other technology needs, such as access to computers. Uh, this, was, this was the only uh, question around uh, technology. Um, so there, we do know, uh, you're absolutely right, that access to computers is, is another component of the digital divide that is known. Um, so it's not just access to the internet, but access to computers, who has a computer in their home. So that was not a question on UQs, but uh, it, it is an important thing. Because I think they're, they're very linked, they're not identical, but I, I think where we see access to the internet as uh, an expressed need, uh, I think you can safely assume that, well, maybe not the exact same number, that where you see groups with higher needs for access to computers or, or the access to the internet, you'll see access to computers as well. And please let me know if I didn't quite answer that question. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, it looks like it's asking about the response rate of 39%. Um, and so is there, you know, it's less than half um, and are there ways to increase it? Uh, yeah, so 39% uh, while being a, an exceptionally high response rate for uh, UQs is fewer than half. Um, there are always questions I mentioned at the beginning of my section that there are questions that I was not doing weighting um, to match the campus uh, percentage. Uh, is, um, but there are ways that we know that, by and large, the response rate is pretty even, um, pretty closely matches the campus. There are places where it doesn't. One persistent problem we have is that women respond more to uh, surveys generally, not just on campus, not just UQs, than men. So we have uh, women are, are overrepresented in the um, sample. We also know that some departments, uh, we historically struggled to get responses from many STEM departments and also uh, POTS uh, School of Business have tend to have lower response rates. So uh, that's a, um, a, a challenge. Uh, in terms of the accuracy, I think that we see pretty good reliability 
um, and both internal and external validity with UQs um, for a lot of uh, the questions that we're using. So I'm not particularly concerned about students misrepresenting things. Um, I think there's always an opportunity for increasing the response rate. One of the challenges when disaggregating a lot of the work that I do uh, around very small groups, for instance, you know, looking at Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, and then looking at intersections within that. If I wanted to say, you know, what's happening with first generation college Native American women, I can't answer that question um, from UQs without redacting all the respondents because there are very few um, respondents. So we do want to actually oversample certain groups and some of the work that the UQ's team and I have done is to try to make sure that we're contacting, uh, for instance, programs within equity and inclusion to say, hey, can you help us reach out to students um, so that we get higher response rates? So for instance, we actually had a higher response rate among Pacific Islanders thanks to the efforts from the Pacific Islander um, program. Uh, and that's been really vital because it's such a small group on campus, we need to oversample that group. So I'm not sure if that answered the question, um, but it's a really important one. Um, any other questions? Um, I don't see any other questions, but uh, I'm open to more. We're in the last um, few minutes. I wanna just mention uh, here that if, please feel free to uh, contact us uh, and uh, email certainly me uh, with any questions around my area. The OPA and adjacent folks tend to be pretty friendly and like hearing from people. So please feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, just to, as I mentioned before, I do have um, some appendices around some of the technical details uh, that were part of my thing. And if you wanted to see what the things are for specific groups, you, know, you can see them in more detail uh, in the appendix to these slides. Um, so, but uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. So please feel free to either ask in voice or in the chat. Andrew, can I ask a quick question? Um, appreciate all, all this and, and shout out to everyone. I'm curious about um, where, it, it, how is this data going to be shared with our chancellor's cabinet? And what are the opportunities for them to inform their strategy decisions that they're making about how we're shaping this upcoming fall? And in this COVID world, we can, you know, think beyond a, a semester, if you will, because the world is being made anew on a, on a daily and weekly basis. But this is really powerful. And, and just being in some of the conversations, I think there's a lot that could be shaped in much significantly better ways with this data. Have you all had an opportunity to already present this to them, train them on them, and any like temperature check on how they responded to this? Um, so uh, to answer your question, uh, this was, uh, we presented this data uh, on the COVID-19 questions from UQs to uh, the cabinets uh, probably in May. Someone else from OPA uh, can correct me on that, but I think it was in May. Um, and I also shared it at the uh, Deans and Chairs meeting in either May or June. Um, so this definitely has been shared, uh, was shared months ago with, um, with cabinet and other campus leadership, um, in part because uh, I, I did think it was really important to do. And I, in fact, I was, um, when I did the initial um, analysis of it, I shared it with the service and a blast to people saying, hey, uh, here's something I think you should know. And as a result, I was invited uh, to uh, present at cabinet and, uh, and also at deans and chairs. So they were definitely responsive to, to that. And I didn't have to push to sort of wheedle my way into that uh, conversation. Um, so, but I, I think it's always worth uh, just reiterating in all that we do just, uh, and again, this is data from uh, the sort of early experiences around 
the, the shelter in place and remote learning, uh, things have really got only gotten worse uh, since then, uh, especially in terms of California, in terms of our our numbers, um, in terms of the impact on the economy. You know, we're just facing massive evictions um, and, and questions as the uh, any of the subsidies and protections um, start to expire. Uh, so it's uh, as grim as things were uh, back in April when these results were first collected. And again, they, they mirrored what was happening um, in June uh, that uh, they're only even more salient right now. Um, I think an exciting- and I Oh, keep going. <laughs> I'll go for it, Beatrice. I was going to say, I think an exciting opportunity that we have coming forward is the fact that like, we've adjusted our survey of new students to capture some of these issues, um, like you know, students' experiences with COVID-19, um, you know, looking at housing insecurity. Um, and I think you know, it doesn't capture the entire student population, but I think it's really important and will be really powerful that we're capturing about like, what are the issues that students are going to be having with their transition uh, to UC Berkeley in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm excited. I mean, I'm I'm terrified, but I'm also excited that we're gonna be able to capture some of this information and hopefully be able to share out about student voices and experiences in this time. Yeah, and Beatrice covered what I was going to say. Um, and also I wanted to add that vice chancellors are also looking at this data and very interested in continuing the conversation around the COVID-19 impact on students and leveraging as much of the data that we have available for them to get a temperature on that and to respond accordingly. So we will definitely continue with the analysis and data collection uh, where we can and also look in some of our administrative data that we have available to us in Cal Answers. Any other general questions to any one of us who presented today? Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. And as Andrew mentioned, this is our contact information uh, on that last slide. And you can reach out to opa at berkeley.edu and that email, when you send that email to that list, or that, that uh, departmental account, it will actually go to all of us who sit in OPA, including our affiliated analysts. So it will go to Andrew as well. And that's probably the best way to get in contact with us. If you have a question or a way to, um, you know, any questions about how we can support your work, any questions about Cal Answers, uh, student data that, um, that goes beyond, let's say, what the help desk can assist with, you can definitely write to opa.berkeley.edu. All right, well, leave it to the data people to provide so much detailed data in their 54 slide presentation. Let's give them all a round of applause using our reaction buttons. Thank you, Sarita, Kira, Beatrice, and Andrew. It was a really wonderful presentation.